He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Losing weight is hard. Imagine tying a piece of string around a very slippery balloon that sometimes inflates and sometimes deflates. Sometimes we need a little bit of a hand. I can't wave a magic wand <laughs> and, you know, make the weight disappear. If you've listened to any other episodes of this podcast, you'll have noticed most of our experts have the same refrain. There's no quick fix. But what if there is? Yeah, so this is a really interesting one, isn't it? Welcome to Healthier Hope Season 3. For Stacey Morrison, the Hope, and in this episode, we're looking at two very different weight loss techniques, but with a kind of similar concept behind them. To reduce the size of the stomach, so you reduce the calorie intake into the body. We're talking surgical gastric banding and virtual gastric banding. I can tell you're all going, virtual gastric banding? What on earth? Is it some sort of avatar, sci-fi, computer-generated type of weight loss? Because I'd never heard of it either. It's not any of those things, and we will explain all. But I think we should start with the more well-known procedure, surgical stomach banding, which has been around since the early 80s. Gastric banding was a very, very long time perceived as a relatively low-risk surgery, as it doesn't involve um, making any cuts on the stomach itself. And it is uh, what's known as a reversible surgery. So if you don't like it, you can always take it out. This is Peng Du. He's an associate professor at Auckland University and part of the gastrointestinal research group at the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. So he knows a lot about the stomach. There's actually, generally speaking, three types of weight loss surgeries. Uh, The first one, and by far the least traumatic one, is gastric banding. The second one, which is actually the most popular one that's currently being done uh, in New Zealand and generally around the world, is called a gastric sleeve, uh, where a portion of the stomach is actually um, cut off during the surgery and the rest sealed up. Um, That is known as a irreversible surgery, so you can't regret it uh, once the decision's made. The third and the most effective uh, weight loss surgery is called a gastric bypass, in which case a portion of the intestine uh, is cut and reconnected to the top of the stomach. Gastric bypass is by far the most traumatic out of all three, but at the same time, it does achieve the best long-term outcome for the patients. How do you figure out if any of these surgeries are for you? We thought the first place to start would be the GP. So we went to the top GP, Dr Brian Betty, the Medical Director of the GP's Association of New Zealand. Look, often it'll be the patient bringing up the issue, but sometimes we do tend to look at what's going on. And if, for instance, if I've got a concern that someone's blood sugars are rising, and they could be on the track to becoming diabetic, and weight I consider an, an issue, I'll maybe start to look at those issues with the patient and start to bring it into the equation or, or part of our thinking. And generally, we'd start by focusing on things like diet and exercise, the basics of trying to lose weight. However, there's a bit of a debate going on about weight at mm-hmm. this point in terms of For some people, they think focusing on weight and focusing on weight reduction is not a good thing to do because weight reduction is actually quite a hard thing to achieve. So there is a line of thinking that if we focus too much on weight, what we're doing is setting people up to fail. The other line of thought is to say, well, in order to do this, we should just focus on healthy living. That is focusing on good decisions around food, focusing on exercise because we know that if you exercise more, that your um, outcomes around cardiovascular disease and diabetes and sugars are going to be a lot, lot better. So just focusing on on good lifestyle choices rather than weight per se. So there's really two ways of approaching it. So when you're asked about losing weight, what do you usually recommend? So it's lifestyle choices first and, and then what else might you recommend? Yeah, so in terms of lifestyle choices, we'd talk about what was achievable If we have access to other services, such as a dietitian, there are now uh, networks that are set up, Food Addicts Anonymous, if you feel you've got an eating problem, we can now have accessibility in a lot of practices to help what's called health improvement practitioners or health coaches who can walk alongside the patient in terms of putting in place modifications to how they approach food or exercise regime. So generally, that's where we'd look, and occasionally a psychologist if we had access to that. 
Um, look, failing that, we would start to talk about other interventions, and that could be medication. So there are some medications around that we could consider using, but they're not that effective because if you use a weight loss medication for a short period of time, which is what you have to do, when you stop the weight loss medication, if they have lost weight, they often put the weight back on if, if the lifestyle choices aren't in place. Yeah, medication, I think, has a limited role. It can kickstart weight loss, but it's not a long-term solution. And obviously, there's things like bariatric surgery, which, which is a big step to take and quite a process in New Zealand. Right, so let's go through that process. So there is a lot of research going into, in particular, bariatric surgery. That's banding or surgery per se. The principle of that is to reduce the size of the stomach so you reduce the calorie intake into the body. You know, we know that once you get up over 160 kilos in particular, that metabolically it becomes really, really difficult to lose weight, that the body is adjusted to a certain weight sort of ideal and it becomes very hard to lose weight. So there are, there are situations where weight reduction is very, very difficult. And if you have comorbidities, that is such as heart disease or diabetes starting to, to present or problems with leg infections that we see or, or swollen legs and mobility, then bariatric surgery probably does have a role to play. And it's certainly been used in that way. One of the problems in New Zealand through the public health system is that there is very restricted access to bariatric surgery. And it's actually very, very tough to get access to surgery. So if I have a patient that I think would be really suitable for surgery, and if they lost weight, they're going to have lots of long-term benefits in terms of health outcomes, it is actually very, very tough to get on the bariatric surgery weight because it's very restricted. It's very, very expensive surgery. So the only other way you can get it done is to pay for it privately, which costs about $25,000. So it's a big, big cost. Or for some patients, I've had a patient or two who have actually travelled overseas to Thailand or Mexico to get it done and then come back to New Zealand. So bariatric surgery probably does have a role to play. Um, however, access to it is very restricted. Is that the only roadblock that you see? I suppose the other thing about bariatric surgery that a lot of, I suppose, the medical world is grappling with at the moment, actually, who is your ideal candidate? Who is the, the, the patient who will get benefit from bariatric surgery long-term in terms of their long-term health outcomes? So how to define that? Because it's a long-term outcome for the person, but also perhaps for the health system if they don't have to have so many interventions later on in their life. Is, is that part of the picture? 100%. So, so looking at your, your health outcome gain, both from a personal or a patient-centred perspective, but also from the system. So you could argue that, OK, if someone maybe is younger, they're going to have some problems down the track. We're seeing those problems starting to develop. If we could intervene with surgery and produce weight reduction, which produced long-term outcomes, and they didn't end up with heart disease, didn't end up with complex medical interventions over time, that there is a potentially a cost saving to that by front-ending the cost of bariatric surgery to produce long-term benefit. So the long and the short of it is that you're unlikely to get bariatric surgery on the public health system at this point in time. You have to have a BMI or body mass index above 35 and other health issues to even be considered, which Betty says has its own complications. You know, there's a lot of controversy about BMI as the only way of looking at weight because weight and obesity becomes really, really complex. So if we look at fat, for instance... There's a line of thought that says that subcutaneous fat, that is fat you see under the skin on arms or legs or around the chest, is actually protective of cardiovascular disease. And there is now a very strong line of thought that actually intra-abdominal fat, that is the fat that sits around the liver, the pancreas, within the abdomen, is actually the fat that drives metabolic problems. That is, drives cardiovascular disease and drives diabetes and things such as this that we associate with weight. Now, the problem with BMI is that it won't pick up intra-abdominal fat. So you can have two people with exactly the same BMI, and one can have substantially more intra-abdominal fat, which is potentially a problem than the other one, and the BMI doesn't give us the answer. The other issue that arises is that people who are actually of a big build, 
um, you know, look, look at the, the patients I see here in Māori or Pacific are actually, actually big build, very tall, very broad. BMI really doesn't equate to obesity or weight in those situations. There's different parameters. But again, we, we've managed to standardise the parameters around the world and they don't pick up that variation in terms of build. So there are a number of problems with BMI. Um, a lot of people are looking at this. So there's a number of different things that have been looked at, but nothing's been landed upon. And at the moment, BMI is the thing that is actually used. Yeah. So when people say you've got heavy bones, is that legitimate or is it a muscle mass? Muscle mass, heavy bones. Yeah, I think those are very, very legitimate right. issues. You know, you look at your All Blacks, they can be 125, 130 kilos, considered perhaps high BMIs or obese if you were to look at a BMI as a rough guide, yet very, very fit with very, very, very low fat. So, yeah, so look, it's a really rough guide and it doesn't suit every situation. There's a lot of problems with it. All right, so it's hard to get. But if you do fit the requirements and you've gone through all the other options, is gastric banding the best course of action for you? Here's Ping Du. Gastric banding, as far as I understand, is no longer recommended in New Zealand. What? Why? Because long-term studies have shown that Uh, patients who receive gastric banding don't achieve um, long-term weight loss. And why is that? Just because the band itself might slip off. You know, imagine tying a uh, piece of string around a very slippery balloon that sometimes inflates and sometimes deflates. Um, It's very hard to keep it on the stomach. And another reason is that patients who have these bands tied around their stomach sometimes could have uh, quite severe reflux, um, a lot of side complications. So we weigh the outcome against the um, cost and complications. I guess the mass just doesn't add up. So that leaves you with the options of the non-reversible surgeries, the gastric sleeve or the bypass surgery. Or you could go new age. Very cool. So... Very cool, you think? So <laughs> well, I think it's very cool to have for any uh, therapy to have its own abbreviations. Oh you know? yeah, <laughs> very good branding. So, how would you describe to people what uh, VBG is? VBG stands for virtual gastric banding. Sometimes it's also known as the hypnotic stomach banding. What it is, it's not a surgery, first of all. The the subjects uh, receive, generally speaking, guided uh, sessions where they train their mind to believe that there is a band placed around their stomach. This is done across multiple sessions, and I, the goal there is to train your mind um, so that you become more disciplined. You don't go for that seconds after each dinner, and you keep your hands out of the cookie jar. Right. So let's bring in the VGB expert. Kia ora. How are Hello. you, Sue? Hello, Stacey. Pleased to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Have a seat just Thank over you. here. Thank yeah? you. That's lovely. Thank you for coming in. Oh, you're welcome. This is Sue Wood from Alpha Hypnosis. She's a clinical hypnotherapist. And I do the virtual gastric band life change program for weight loss. Wood's been doing virtual gastric bands for about seven years after training with a UK therapist who kind of pioneered the therapy. What we're trying to achieve is using hypnosis and hypnotherapy, so exercises and procedures, to help them change their subconscious mind to believe that they've had a virtual gastric band fitted to their tummy so that it becomes much smaller and they only need much smaller amounts of food. So they start to believe they yes. have a gastric band as they would in a surgical operation. Yes, absolutely. Except, of course, the virtual gastric band is one heck of a lot cheaper than uh, going in for surgery, um, any sort of bariatric surgery. Most clinics offering VGB do it through some one-on-one sessions and take-home resources. The costs run anywhere from 700 to $900. Some, like Sue, do online group programs for around $400. So not cheap, but a tenth of the price of surgery. And, you know, there's so many benefits from it because it's completely natural. You know, hypnosis has been around for thousands of years. It goes back to the Egyptian sleep temples where they used to put people into trance to help heal them and they would leave them in there for days. You know, indigenous people, they've used drumming, um, stamping their feet, uh, dancing. 
the haka is a, a prime example. You watch the concentration on their faces when they're doing the haka. It's they're absolutely totally focused. Incredible. And that's yeah, and that's what we try to do with the hypnosis is get them to focus on the goal and that particular thing that they're aiming for. Right. So when you say that people are tapping into listening to resources, mm. It's probably important to clarify that hypnosis is not always, say, someone standing on a stage telling you to eat an onion, <laughs> is it? So no. how how does it actually happen? What you have to remember with, with stage hypnosis is that those people go and volunteer to do silly things. They know they're going to be have to imagine that they're James Bond. And look, you know, we're all suggestible in varying degrees. That's why you have advertising on the radio, on TV and all over the place. And that's the entertainment side of it. It can be a lot of fun if it's done ethically and properly. With hypnotherapy, that is, is using hypnosis and therapy to help the person achieve the goal that they want to achieve. So I can't make them do anything they don't want to do. And I use relaxation to help them get into that hypnotic state, if you like, deliberately. But what a lot of people don't realise is that hypnosis is actually a, a very natural state, one that we go in and out of a number of times during the day or at night. You know, when you dream, that's you going in, into that level, that, that brain wave level, if you like. And um, when you're totally focused on something uh, like reading or if you've ever been to a movie that where you've got involved in the emotional, you know, you, you feel yourself tearing up because it's a sad movie or, or, you know, you want to put your hands up to your eyes because it's scary. They're all examples of, of, of going into that state just naturally and normally. And we all do it. And all I do is guide someone using those relaxation techniques and processes to help them access what's going on in their subconscious mind. So you would say things to them like, so that they believe that they have a restriction on their yes. stomach and they can't yep. eat as much as usual, is that right? Yes, yes. And yes, that's one of the sessions. I don't do individual sessions. It's a, it's a program yeah. because people need to be committed. But it's it actually hypnosis can make it so much simpler. The virtual gastric band, I reckon, is a brilliant program. Well, you'd expect her to say that, but Woods also talking from her own experience on the other side of the therapist's couch. I started helping people um, with the virtual gastric band, and I I, I was just. I loved it. I absolutely loved helping people with it. And then I realised, you know, it suddenly hit home how overweight I was. I was um, about 87 kilos, and I'm, I'm only short. I was reaching for a size 24 because the 22 wouldn't fit me. And it suddenly hit me. I had one of those light bulb moments, you know, goodness, therapist, help yourself. And so I, I listened to the recordings and... Even though I'd been a hypnotherapist for 18 years, I think it was, and I knew the power of hypnosis and, and the imagination and the subconscious mind, even I was absolutely blown away by how powerful it was. From the very first time I listened to the recording, um, I went immediately to a small plate, a side plate, a, a bread and butter plate. And even now, four or five years later, or whatever it is, I still have my, my meals on a bread and butter plate. And and that's normal, you know. It's I, I just don't eat. And, and I was eating from a great big dinner plate with a massive amount of, of food on it. And what, I mean, you were kind enough to share your weight then. <laughs> Did you lose a, a yes, I lost, big number? Um, yeah, I lost, um, I think it was 16 and a half kilos to get to the, that was within about seven months because this is a natural, gradual, effective way of losing weight. Um, so that was over seven months and that was to my goal weight. And then since then, um, I've sort of dropped another two or three kilos. But I'm thinking now of, of, of getting down another two or three. You know, you, you get to the stage where you, you realise things like, you know, I've still got a bit of a tummy. And, you know, that's the dangerous part because that, um, that fat is the visceral. Yeah, a visceral. It's, you could be in your organs. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to be unhealthy.
but even Wood acknowledges that hypnotherapy doesn't always work. I see um, a very good success rate. It's not for everybody. They have to want to do it. I can't make them do something they don't want to do. Um, And they have to be prepared to put the commitment in. I can't wave a magic wand (laughs) and, um, you know, make the weight disappear. And I also can't be with people 24-7. So they need to take responsibility. I help them work out a plan of, you know, their weaknesses, their strengths and how they're going to use them. And um, the uh, weaknesses, what can they do to um, get around those? And, you know, like it could be I've got a weakness for chocolates. So initially they're not going to have any in the house. For me, (laughs) I had a weakness for chocolate. And for me, I took the chocolate and I I broke it into pieces, dark chocolate, love it. And um, I put it in a plastic bag and shoved it right in the back of the freezer. And every night I would take out one piece and I limited myself to that. And then weeks later after the holiday, I realised that when we'd gone away on holiday, I hadn't thought about the chocolate in the freezer, come back. And weeks later, I'm helping a client and I suddenly realised the chocolate was still in the freezer and I hadn't had any for a couple of months. So all of the weight loss programs basically come back to lifestyle and our ability to make positive choices. Yes. So how does hypnotherapy help people make those lifestyle choices? Okay. So what it does is it it actually helps people tap into the power of the subconscious mind. You see, what happens is that we've built up our behaviours and habits over years, especially with weight. You know, it might be that they've put on weight when they've um, got married or had kids or when they were teenagers and felt isolated or even from childhood for various reasons, lots of various reasons. So they've, they've got into a habit of whatever it is that they've, they're doing now, if you like. And one of the things I say to my clients is it's not your fault that you're overweight because it just sort of snuck up on you. It's not your fault. And by the time you realised, oh, crikey, I look at me and then started on all these fad diets and things, um, it was all, the habit was already embedded. And of course, you know, while they're, there's some really healthy food options out there that doesn't address what's going on in your subconscious mind. It doesn't address the habits that are already there. And this is why there is still issues with surgery and even gym programs and, and stuff like that. They're great, don't get me wrong. They, you know, the gym programs, I go to the gym. But alone, it doesn't necessarily change what's going on in your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind is your driver. Right. It's your inner driver, and it's what drives you. So you're saying even with surgery, some people can manage to put the weight back on because they weren't able yes. to make a, yes. a change at a subconscious level. And the same with the gym. Apparently it doesn't work if you don't actually go and use your membership. <laughs> yeah. You've got to go. You've got to be involved. So in that way, can you explain how the brain can impact the stomach? Oh, easily. You know, the mind affects the uh, the body, the body affects the mind. You know, we've got the gut brain, we've got uh, all sorts of various microbes, hormones, everything all around our body. The, it's all interconnected. So once you get your mind retrained into better habits, healthier habits, that actually affects your body. You know, one of the things that my clients have told me is that they feel much more energy. They feel much more motivated to go to the gym. One of my clients today said, you know, I feel really happy. She said, before when I was overweight, I used to feel guilty. But now I feel happy because she said my mind is stronger. So it's helped her emotional resilience. Um, You know, I've been there when I've had been on a diet and I've had a hiccup. I've blown out my diet. Oh, okay, get back onto it. And then, you you know, a few weeks later, you do it again. And then eventually you think, oh, to hell with it. Give it up. It's all about putting it in a perspective so that if you do have a slip up, it's that's fine. Just put it into perspective. It's done. Move on. And that's about retraining their mind to accept that. You know, I can go out now and if I want to, I can go and have a double chocolate muffin for lunch. Not exactly healthy, not what I I would, you know, suggest having as a healthy meal. But I can go and have a double chocolate muffin for lunch and that is fine. And it doesn't send you in a spiral. No, because 
That's I chose to do it. Right. So it's literally about eating mindfully because you yes. trained your mind rather than mindlessly. Yeah. I mean, all of these things is about focusing your attention. We help the client focus on their goal and, and how to get there. Now we're at the part you've all been waiting for. Can we actually trick our minds into believing our stomachs have been banded? Here's Brian Betty. There is some research to say that it could possibly work. That's what's really interesting about it. Now, it goes back to hypnosis as a technique, because what we know about hypnosis is that about 20% of people are very, very susceptible to hypnosis. About 40 to 60% of people are sort of moderately responsive to hypnosis and suggestions that are put in place by hypnosis. And we know that 20 to 30% of people, it has no benefit whatsoever. And probably what the evidence shows, those people that are very susceptible to hypnosis or have a moderately susceptible to hypnosis um, could actually respond to techniques that indicate that you've had gastric banding or that your stomach has shrunk and that you eat less food. And as I said, there is a little bit of evidence around to say that does actually work. The issue becomes why does the hypnosis work in these situations? And frankly, if you ask 10 different people as to why the hypnosis worked, you'd get 10 different answers. Um, No one quite knows. There is some discussion that it's about placebo effect, that if you suggest something, then a certain percentage of people will actually start to believe that it's it's an auto-suggestion technique. So, And we know that placebo and the opposite of that, nocebo, where you suggest something bad will happen. We know that about 30 to 40 percent of people would perceive that to have happened. And that's a very real effect, placebo, nocebo effect. So for whatever reason, hypnosis does work for some people. So in this particular situation, absolutely, it could actually be part of what goes on. I think virtual gastric banding is a very smart marketing term, though, um, and that's probably the, the big thing that's been done here. But there is probably some basis for some people with doing this. Pendu agrees with Betty on one point. I think it's very good branding. And he's equally cautious about the benefits of virtual gastric banding. You know, as long-time um, listeners of your podcast would uh, know, there's a this term called the large-scale randomised clinical trial that must be done. Uh, to prove whether a therapy is medically effective or not. And to my knowledge, there hasn't been such trial done on the uh, virtual gastric banding technique. However, based on the uh, smaller studies um, that's been done so far, um, its effect is um, comparable to just receive no more relaxation therapy. And in fact, uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, one of the top medical institutions in the world, did say on their website that the hypnosis-based therapy, um, you know, over an 18-month period, on average, uh, patients lose about 2.7 kilograms of weight. Whether that's a lot of weight or not um, is quite subjective. But, um, you know, I did the math, and for somebody whose target it is to lose about 40 kilograms. It only counts for about 7% or 8% of the uh, um, target weight loss. Is that effective, given that there's usually a cost component associated with these therapies? Um, I think that's up to the individuals to decide. Um, and obviously, um, you know, you have uh, individuals who achieve great results. And in fact, even in clinical trials, you know, there's a good amount of evidence that there's a sort of mind over matter belief, you know, placebo effect, just by going through this sort of visualization, you know, training, mind reprogramming, you you can actually achieve some sort of uh, results. But, you know, as a scientist, I think I'm more interested in the actual mechanisms behind it. For example, if you go to your doctors and they say, hey, take this drug, it, you know, would solve your problems, you know, why take it? But then they tell you, but we have no idea how it works. Well, you know, you probably still take it, but, you know, your confidence level drops a little bit. You know, it would be ideal if we can figure out how it works because then we can actually design these therapies to be more targeted and have less side effects. But he's not ready to write it off either. At the same time, after a bit of research um, on this, it's perhaps not an entirely uh, hoax um, thing because the interesting thing about the gut is that it has a very strong connection with the brain. In fact, the gut has as much neurons in the gut as a cat's brain. This is in, this is in the human gut. It's often known as the little brain of the human body. So clearly there is some sort of um, modulatory effect going on between the central nervous system, the, the brain, and the gut. So 
I try not to be very dismissive to anything that, you know, have a tangible uh, positive outcomes for people and really tease out, you know, the facts from the fiction and focus on the facts and how they work. The healthy or the hoax. Yes, yes. that's right. So let's give a rating, healthy or hoax. Out of five, how effective would you say virtual gastric banding is? I would give it about a 2.5 as usual, you know, somewhere in between. And what about surgical gastric banding? Uh, there's, well, I think that the evidence on that is pretty clear that, you know, when you weigh up the cost and um, uh, benefit ratio, it just doesn't work out. It's better, um, again, go to your doctors for their actual medical opinion, but, you know, the literature and the academic evidence seems to suggest that sleeve is just much more effective um, in terms of long-term uh, weight loss management than gastric banding surgery. But the two things, the surgery and the VGB, um, they're not quite comparable because mm. surgery is kind of a very drastic end-of-the-line treatment for weight loss, whereas these sort of um, hypnosis-based therapies, you know, the things you try out before then. Okay, so let's give it a rating. So one, one being the lowest? Yes. Or, oh, I'd say it's about a one. Yeah. And just for reference as well, then what do you give gastric sleeve and then gastric bypass. I think the evidence, again, on the surgical um, out, you know, outcomes um, are very clear. So you know, I would you know, go with the maximum score, 5.5. <laughs> and Dr. Betty's rating? OK, so for those that are susceptible to it, not for everyone, if we look across a section of people, yeah, I'd probably sit around 2, 2.5. Mm-hmm. Your tone of voice is a lot too. <laughs> yes, I'm trying to, trying to ponder it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's absolutely fine. I really appreciate you putting a mark in the sand. But it might be something that people could consider before they go to what is a, a really intrusive surgical operation? Look, I mean, you know, um, we send people off to psychologists, we send people off to dietitians, and they pay privately, which is a cheaper option. So this could be an option that someone would want to try or consider with no guarantee of it working, but knowing that for some people it does work. So it could be a very valid way of going forward. And certainly, yeah, in terms of 900 versus $25,000, a, a cheaper option. So if you're suggestible, VGB could be an option to help you lose weight. With a healthier hoax rating of about 2.5, the science suggests it works for some, but we don't really know how or why. Surgical banding, on the other hand, has now been proven to be ineffective. If you think surgery might be for you, you'll need to consider one of the irreversible options and start saving your pennies to go private. But if you can wait long enough, Pen Du and his team might have a third option. Part of our research, uh, working with our collaborators from the uh, US, uh, supported by the US National Institute of Health, is to look at how to modulate the neural functions that's coming from the brain to the gut in an attempt to actually control the gut itself. Wow. Yeah, so this is actually targeting known physiological pathways to change the physiology of digestion. Hopefully, you know, that will lead to something akin to a device you can wear and it can administer stimulation protocols that can regulate your appetite. Oh, that's and that exciting. will be based on a mechanistic approach. A device to regulate your appetite. That really would be sci-fi coming to life. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thanks for listening to Healthy or Hoax, hosted by me, Stacey Morrison. A huge thank you to Peng Du, Brian Betty and Sue Wood for their expertise. This episode was produced by Liz Garten and engineered by Alex Aylett McMillan and Jeremy Veal. The executive producer is Tim Watkin. You can find all the Healthy or Hoax episodes on the RNZ website or any of the podcasting apps like Apple Podcasts, Spotify or iHeartRadio. While you're there, check out RNZ's other brilliant podcasts like Voices. And follow us so you don't miss the next episode, the last for this season. It's all about collagen.